Right, let's, uh, let's make a start in. So uh, talk number two, uh, if I can introduce Stephen from AWS and uh, speaking on a topic which uh, as somebody who's involved in advocacy, I know there's a huge amount of interest in this and uh, n not a, a considerable amount of uh, trepidation as well, if I can put it that way. So um, very, very interesting topic. Uh, lots of developers wanting to know about this. Are we all about to become prompt engineers or replaced entirely? I'm sure every and all questions we might have to uh, need answered will be resolved during this talk, okay? So without further ado, over to Stephen. Hello, folks. Uh, before I begin, does anyone get the joke I put in the title? I spent a lot of work on that, and it turns out no one in Northern Ireland watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, folks. I'm Stephen Howell. I'm really, really pleased to be accepted to speak here. This is my first time speaking at NIDC. I have spoken to um, lots of uh, folks in Belfast and all over Northern Ireland, but I'm from Loud, so I had a little bit of a drive this morning in wonderful weather, and uh, we lost electricity last night, uh, which is the first time that I can remember losing electricity in years uh, because of the storm. So I hope none of you had the exciting experience I had of trying to console the dog who uh, was very stressed by not having electricity last night. So uh, what I'm talking about today, though, is uh, not like the other hall, which we're talking about empathy, um, because I realized when I was competing with an empathy talk that I had no hope because uh, I was actually born without any empathy. Uh, well, I should say manufactured. I wasn't born being a robot. But uh, that's what I said in my last interview anyway, because like many of you, I'm very concerned that generative AI is going to replace me. The robots are coming to take away my job. And uh, I meet a lot of developers who say, oh, I'm not worried. I tried the generative AI, and it was dumb as hell, so I'm still in a job. It's terrible when you're comparing yourself to something that's dumb as hell in the hope of keeping your job. But anyway, uh, many of you will have seen that the AI, the generative AI, has gotten smarter and better and is, people are now saying, uh, maybe I should tell my kids that that computer science degree they're doing is a bad idea. Prompt engineering is the new future. It's either that or be an influencer. And that's a bit worrying because, as you can tell, I have a white beard and my entire, I wouldn't call it a career, I mean, career would be a very generous word to use, but my entire life of employment be it as a software engineer for most of it, or a computer science lecturer when I got fed up doing that, or back into industry like I am now, has been about trying to teach people how to build cool things with software. And usually that's with AI. Right now it's with cloud and AI, but it's building stuff. And if you suddenly take that away and say, hey, we don't need any of that anymore, I've got a lovely robot over here, then that's quite a stressful proposition. So I know, as I begin this talk, that this is the picture many people who have white beards like me worry about. Now, I see a lot of students in the audience, and you're like, we're cool students. We don't have white beards, <laughs> you know? We've got hair. You know, okay, yeah, I get you, I'm old, but being old just means I have lots of experience, okay? And I'm used to younger developers asking me lots of questions. Now, you may have seen a movie that I quite like, it's called The... Uh, Return of the Jedi, and in it, Yoda is asked many questions by Luke. And Luke keeps asking Yoda questions because he's the old mentor. Yoda's 800 years old at this point. And Yoda's asked so many questions that he literally gives up and dies just to get away from Luke Skywalker. <laughs> and it's incessant questions. So sometimes as a white beard, I feel the same way because students keep asking me the same question nowadays. It used to be, should I study Java or C Sharp? And the answer would be, it doesn't matter. Study whatever the lecturer tells you to do. And then when you graduate, whatever the employer tells you to do. I'm like, what do you mean? Surely I must master the language. And I'm no, no, you, you're going to do your absolute best to get a job. And then you're going to do your absolute best to do it well. And then you're going to hope they pay you and promote you. Trying to become a master before you even start the job is not going to work. You don't specialize. But now we've come along with this robot, and it's already specialized in everything. So how do we compete? So one thing I notice on Twitter a lot, 
Uh, sorry, I know it's called something else now, but I've actually stopped using it. <laughs> so whatever it's called nowadays, whatever I notice on LinkedIn a lot is that people are posting, I'm an entrepreneur and I have a startup and I generated my app in two minutes and I'm going to make a billion next week. They don't say a billion what, but something. Now, that's cool if you're in the tiny percentage of developers who are startups who only have the ideas person who has a subscription to OpenAI, <laughs> and then the rest of you, and they don't know any developers. But for those of us who are actually writing software, and hopefully some of you in the audience at the NIDC actually write software, I can't really tell because the lights are in my eyes, but I can sense the nerdiness. So I know that you can write software, and I'm very proud to be amongst my people. But here's the thing. Most people are not cool new startups who need a tool to generate their app. They have an idea, they're looking for a developer. Most developers are like me. They were old warriors fighting in the Clone Wars, or in IBM, whichever, and they're writing software all day. That is not cool, that no one's going to know about. At one point in my mid-twenties, I'd written software which made ATMs work in a particular bank. I did that for IBM. I had written software which made you know, weird things happen behind the scenes with banking systems. I can't really go home and say to my granny, granny, guess what? I wrote the software which ensures financial transactions go through at a high throughput and no loss of decimal point accuracy. Because she would go, so what? I was a professor of computer science, that's easy. Not everyone's granny was a professor of computer science, I had it hard. Now, when you're a normal standard enterprise developer, you're writing in COBOL and Java and so on, and you're afraid to tell people this because they will look down on you. You meet a cool student and they're like, I do Python and I do other cool things. And you say, I do COBOL. And they'll go, oh, keep away. I don't want to catch it. Now, the thing is, I actually am going to admit, I had to do COBOL in university in one, for one subject, one semester in first year, but I've never written COBOL in anger. But one of my first jobs was writing software which translated COBOL data sets into XML. And I wrote an XML parser to do that because it's so long ago we didn't have them already as standard. And nowadays, XML is ugh, disgusting, but back then it was cool. Now, I had a girlfriend at the time. She's not my girlfriend anymore. She didn't get sense and she married me. But the thing is, is that she had a job writing COBOL. And she had to, you know, keep back from the other developers who were afraid of catching it. And she used to say, you know what? Just like Michael Caine in that terrible movie, he's never seen the movie, but he can show you the really nice house that it paid for. So she's like, yeah, COBOL is ugly and simple. And she studied Java and C++ in college. She was one of those C++ ninjas. It's like Darth Vader walking into an Ewok party. There's no hope. But the thing is, the thing is, is that everyone looked down on it because, ugh. Yet, it paid well. And she got to write all this software, which had been there as a legacy in the bank she worked in for decades. Decades. Now, if you said, hey, I'm going to pay you a crazy amount of money, but you have to work with COBOL, a lot of you right now would say, that's like saying, pay me a crazy amount of money, but I have to do it in a swimming pool filled with sewage up to my neck all day. I'm not doing it. However, if I said, but I can give you a generative AI tool, that will help you translate from it, some of you might reconsider depending on just how much sewage was there. So I want to tell you a true story of uh, uh, a, a moment in my life when I realized I was truly old. Okay, And when I was about 30 years ago, when I was a teenager, I wrote some software for a little local company in a local village near me, Dunlear. And they were very nice trusting a teenager to write software, and I wrote it. And it was a data, simple database system. This is before the internet. I know this is hard for some of you to understand, but there was a time before the internet, okay? And we did have cars and things like that and computers, you know, but we just didn't have internet. Yes, we didn't have Stack Overflow. I know this is confusing and frightening, but we didn't have Google either. 
And what we had were these things called books. And you read the book, and the information somehow went into your brain, and then you tried to write software badly. So I was not a very good software developer. Of course, being a teenager, I thought I was like Dark Feck and Vader writing software. I was amazing. Looking back, I realized I was more like an Ewok. But, you know, I was doing my best. And I wrote the software, and the company paid me for the software. I was very happy. I think the money paid for second year of university, I can't remember, but I was happy to get paid. And I delivered that software on a Dell sort of desktop, looks kind of like that one, that they supplied to me, they bought it, I wrote the software on it, I gave it back to them. Yes, you may say, why didn't I just email it to them? I didn't have email. It existed, but I didn't have it, and they didn't know what it was. So anyway, I wrote the software, and I forgot about it. Years later, I had a child. I had four children, and I still have. And when Jack, my eldest, got to the point in secondary school where he's required to do work experience, you do the terrible thing that all parents have to do. You annoy your friends who have businesses. And you say, could you please take my teenager for a week and don't let them do anything that's dangerous? Now, Jack did two work placements. Sorry, Jack, I have to reveal this. The first one was the little company I wrote the software for. The second one was at Stobart Air, the week the entire industry shut down for COVID, and Stobart Air never reopened. So Jack, in his first week working, managed to destroy a company. <laughs> he says it's not quite like that, that COVID was involved, but we only have the evidence we have. So. We're waiting to see what next job Jack gets. But anyway, so a long time ago, in a town not so far away, I'd written the software. I rang up the same company. I said, hey, look, remember me? I'd kept in touch with them. You know, remember that baby that I had 17 years ago? Would you mind taking him for a work placement for a week? And they gave him something to do. But on his first day, they brought him over, and they showed him this computer. And they said, this is the computer. And Jack said, this is an old computer. Jack is autistic, he's very direct. And they said, yes, we bought this computer on eBay last year. And Jack said, I hope you didn't pay very much. And they said, no, 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 it doesn't matter. This is the exact spec, the exact spec of the computer that runs our very important software. And Jack said, you should get a refund. And they said, no, 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 no. And they showed him the source code, because I had delivered the source code, and at the top, it had S. Howell as the author. So Jack went home, and the name of the software was Sensort. I wasn't very imaginative for names, because it was sensors, and it sorted things. I'm going to stop for the photographer. <laughs> I do this for a living. You know, you always have to stop, or else the picture comes out like this. I've yet to see a picture, I'm not going... <laughs> so, Jack came home and said, Dad, do you remember software called Sensort? And then I had the revelation that I was old. So I said, Sensort? Sensort? That's a name I haven't heard in a long, long time. And he said, do you know it? I said, of course I know it. I wrote it, but I forgot about it. I wish I'd charged the company per use instead of a flat-out fee, but hey. Now, they'd been using the software for the 17 years since I'd written it. And because they were afraid to upgrade the computer and they were afraid to connect it to the internet in any way, they kept buying on eBay the exact model and then transferring it over on floppy disk. <laughs> so, this is what I did. I, as a completely free, as a learning experience for myself and for my 17-year-old, I said, let's, Jack, let's take the software. I'd written it in Java. 1.3. <laughs> we're now up at Java 20 or something, I don't know, but anyway. And we're going to move this over to a cloud environment. And the company didn't want it on the cloud, they were afraid. They'd heard about the cloud. To them, the cloud is dark and full of terrors. But to me, the cloud is the safest place to keep your data, not on your computer that you got on eBay. So we did a learning experience. Jack knows how to code a little bit. He's doing it in college, but he's not interested in enterprise coding or money. Jack just wants to make video games. And, uh, you know, that's fine. That's what some people like. I like to play video games. I tried making them, but uh, all my video games were like Wordle for nerds. And, you know, it's just no one wants to play those, sadly. So when I did this 
experience, I realized that I, I'd lost my way. I was no longer a Java developer. I could no longer claim to be one with the Sun slash Oracle ecosystem. I didn't even have a Java IDE on my computer. I had forsaken Eclipse. But I had generative AI. So I went to the one I had for free, which was uh, Amazon Code Whisperer, which is free to students and to people who are doing personal and open source projects. I wasn't using this for a business use, because that does cost money. And I used Amazon Bedrock, which for me was free, but for you would cost money. And I tried a few different strategies. Like at first I tried to give it the whole repo and it just was not happy with me because in fairness, I wrote it when I was a teenager and the code made it cry. But I discovered that if I gave it in chunks and said, this is what this code is meant to do, and I asked it three things. The first one was, could you make this code, could you clarify what I would have to do to this code to make it work in a cloud environment using the following resources. So I didn't want to just go EC2 or anything like that or a virtual machine. I wanted to go as serverless as possible. And it was able to give me direct answers. Well, you've got a relational database now. You're going to need one in the cloud. Or you could switch to a NoSQL database, and this is how you do it. I liked that. But that wasn't very helpful for Jack, because you know Jack isn't into that type of stuff. Jack pointed out that uh, I might have had let's just say a few bad practices in my code. Because Jack found a few hard-coded passwords, which were usually things like Aileen is cool, who was my girlfriend at the time and now his mother. So I said, yeah, it's hard-coded in, but you know, that's the way we did things back then, you know? And Jack was like, yeah, but anyone can look at the source code and see the password, and they're very worried about security. And I said, this is a good point. So I asked Amazon Code Whisper to search the code base and find security vulnerabilities. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say, I'm so smart there were none. There was a few, <laughs> OK? But they were all things where I went, ah, yeah, back then I had no idea how to do that, and this seemed like the only way. Now I know better. So I still needed to be a human with experience to validate the things it was saying, because some of them you know, were, that's not actually a security issue, because I would never do that. But you did do it. Yeah, but I did it decades ago. I wouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> and you can fix it. The final one was, I wanted to add in a lot of code that didn't exist to make it cloud ready. And in order to do that, I could study, learn, ask questions in Stack Overflow, or I could type in a comment that said, make the code do this, and let Code Whisperer generate the code for me. Now, that's the one I did. But I was very aware that if this was a real commercial project and I was to go back to the company, and say, I have cloud-enabled your software. They didn't want it. But if it had been, they would have had a question for me. They're a commercial company. They don't want software that's encumbered by certain open source licenses that they don't want to fulfill. And I'd have to be able to say, and imagine if I was a student having to be able to say to my professor, all the code generated is either open source, MIT licensed, whatever it is to use or not. And Code Whisperer will say, this code, the source of this code, the idea for this code, the model for this code came from code with these licenses. And you can accept or reject it. Because you might say, I'm not allowed any open source licenses in, our, in my company, or I'm only allowed open source licenses in my course, whichever it is. So they were the important factors for me when I asked questions. Now, remember, Amazon Codewitz was just one of many new IDE tools that are coming out. I used it in Visual Studio Code. It was free for me. If you're testing it out as a, a student or a personal developer, it'll be free for you too. You do have to give an email to it, but that's it for a, an AWS Builder account. But the thing that was useful for me was having that experience of a pair programming that wasn't my now He's now 19, but he was 17 then. <laughs> Having a 17-year-old beside me, because pair programming with a 17-year-old is like Luke with Yoda. It's just constant questions when you're trying to focus on the code. Now, a good thing about pair programming is the questions, to me. It's not about two geniuses working on a code base together. It's about questions back and forward so that you develop a better understanding. 
But guys, I'm old. I hate pair programming. That's something that cool kids do. I just want to sit in a dark room with my hood up and green lights flashing on my face. At least that's what I see on TV. I assume that's what I'm meant to do. This job didn't come with a manual. But for me, Code Whisperer became a coding companion. It became a pair programming tool because I would ask it silly questions and it would gently suggest the answers to me. Now, did I, could I have replaced me with Jack in that situation, the 17-year-old? No, because Jack didn't have the coding experience to validate the suggestions. Sometimes the suggestions are wrong. Sometimes they're half right and half wrong. And sometimes they're perfect, but you need to be able to judge. And luckily, I had been a Java developer. It had been a while, but I had been. Now, Code Whisper doesn't work on COBOL, but I'm also not a COBOL developer. And if you said, this COBOL was generated by Code Whisper, is it right? I wouldn't know. I'd have to go ask my wife, who is a COBOL developer or was. So you still need the human in the loop. You still need the pair in the pair programming to be a human. So the security and the licensing are two cool features that I like about Code Whisper because you know, I've, I've written a lot of software for my academic research, and it's going to be all uh, open source when the university gets around to doing that, whatever they have to do to make it open source. And that's important to me that my code is open source. I want to share it out. But I also work for a company where I have to go through a legal process to make sure that my source code is open source and that I haven't used code that's encumbered by other licenses. So this is the safety guards that depending on the situation I'm in, whether I'm writing code for me, my academic research in the university, or my work, that I'm making sure that I'm protected because I've not generated code using a license that I'm not allowed to use and submitted it and said, it'll be grand. You can't do that when you're being paid for the software. Now, uh, I'd like to do a little demo if that's okay. I hope people don't mind a little demo. Um, the only other slide I have is for uh, the people reading the slides afterwards. So I'm going to stop showing that. And I'm going to pop up here. Uh, I'm just going to move it over to that monitor. Oh, and I've been talking so long I have to log in again, but that's OK. This is where we hope the internet uh, lasts long enough for me to, to do the demo. But the internet's been very good today, so fingers crossed. And I'm just logging in again because it is timed out. And there we go. So what I'm showing you now is a, a interface. Yeah, I'm going to move it over. I'm waiting for it to log in. The internet's not as fast as what I have at home. There we go. It's quite fast. So this is Amazon Bedrock. And what Amazon Bedrock lets you do is specify the model you want to use out of a range of open source and commercial models, like we've Claude uh, from Anthropic. We have our own model. We have AI21 Labs models, stability diffusion models. And Bedrock just acts as a common layer in between all these models. Now, some models cost money. Some do not. You know, uh, and if the model you're using is free, all you pay for is the juice, the compute, from us. So this means you don't have to have a supercomputer on your desktop to run these models. You can just send a request using your AWS account, if Bedrock is enabled, saying, this is what I want, and get it back. Now, if you've used uh, any of these AI, generative AI tools with a chat interface, you can use it like that, but that's not how I'm using it today, though it's similar. So uh, here, I, I made an uh, example earlier on, and I'm just going to paste it in now and read it out, rather than type it out, because there's nothing worse than watching someone type. So I'm, I can't actually see. Ah, I have to look at this monitor on the ground, by the way, <laughs> to see. So I'm going to go to text in this playground and select the model I want to use. And I'm clicking wrong. And let's use Anthropic, because I like it and Claude V2. Now, the other thing I can do, 
which is important, is specify the maximum length to return. By default, it's 300, but let's go crazy and put it up to, I don't need this much, but you know, I can specify that if I want. I can also control the temperature and um, everything else, but I'm not gonna touch any of those right now. I'm gonna scroll over here and paste in my prompt I wrote earlier on, and I'll just read this out in case that's very hard to read. Uh, generate the create table statement for an attendee database for a developer conference in Europe. Some attendees will be speakers. Some attendees, I spelled attendees wrong, will be students. All tickets are 100 euro and each attendee needs to be marked as paid slash unpaid. Students go half price, speakers go free, the database will be MariaDB. Now, I just made that up about 10 minutes ago, I hope that's okay. You could put some finesse on it, but if I click on run, it generates it, and that's all not running on my computer, that's running on the cloud. It gives create table attendees, it has an auto increment for the primary key, it has some var chars for name and email, it has different ticket types, regular student and speaker, but it defaults to regular. It has have they paid or not, defaulting to no, and uh, their speaker role. And it gives some details. Now, if I was to ask the question, well, wait a minute, how would that actually work if I was a developer not using this interface, I can click view API here and it actually gives me the JSON that is submitted as part of an API request I would make to AWS with exactly what I have to have. It includes the body prompt and I get back JSON with the answer you see there and I could specify just return the SQL, I don't want any fluff. Like, don't tell me how it works. And it'll just give me back the SQL. So the value of this would be in an IDE, being able to type a comment saying this, and for whatever IDE you like, it can send it off to one of these models and get back an answer. You could even let the user specify the model based on what they're willing to pay, because different models cost different amounts. The next thing would be useful for is if you're building a tool for making apps. So I often think that the people who made the real money with the gold rushes were the people who sold the sold the shovels, because everyone who's going to the gold rush, some of them will make it rich, they'll find gold, but all of them need to buy a shovel, sell the shovels. Now, it's the same thing here. Some people are going to make amazing tools which generate apps, and you could be one of them, but the people who are using those tools generally aren't developers who don't know SQL. And you're saying, but I'm ever so smart, and I studied SQL in college, I can do this. Yeah, you can, but when you, your beard turns this color, if you have a beard, not everyone has a beard, but if it, you do, then this is very handy because I can type this into my IDE and get the results I want. Can I show you one more? I'm gonna just tweak it slightly. So when I started in AWS uh, this year, this terrible thing happened. I discovered that they don't like relational databases. They sell them, they have them, but they, love NoSQL databases. They love DynamoDB. There's a big DynamoDB team in Dublin, and they love DynamoDB. And if you say something sacrilegious like, I like SQL, you'll get a slap. Now, metaphorically, they don't actually slap me. Because I work remotely, it'd be a long drive just to slap me. Now, here's the thing. I didn't really know NoSQL. Like, I knew what it was, MongoDB, all that stuff. But I didn't care, because I used to be a databases lecturer, and I had to teach the pain of SQL to pissed-off undergraduates who did not want to learn it. And I did not want to teach it, but I still had to do it. And at the end of the day, everyone was unhappy. And if I, I sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, and I think, boys, cod, normal form, and I'm in a cold sweat. But you know what? I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. Because all I have to do now is go by the gospel of DynamoDB. Uh, so I also learned GraphQL. Now, I read that GraphQL was created by uh, Facebook, now Meta. I don't know if anyone here is from that uh, particular company, as, uh, as a way to do the very important uh, social media they do, but folks, GraphQL was very strange to me. 
So I have rewritten the statement above, only I've changed it to be from SQL to GraphQL statement, and the database will be DynoDB. That's all I've changed, those two words. So it's the same query, but I've changed that. And I have 40 seconds left. And in those 40 seconds, I'm going to hit Run. And GraphQL is still scary to me. I've written a good bit of it this year because I had to learn it. And as you can see, it's appearing there. You know, even if you don't know GraphQL, it looks kind of right. Looks kind of weird, looks kind of right. But that's the thing. It actually explains the key parts in case I'm an idiot like I am. It says, this is what the GraphQL does. Now, I can use other models and say, can you, uh, I can ask the Amazon model. I, can ask, I could ask Stability Diffusion, but it makes images, so it's just going to draw me a picture. <laughs> Here's a picture of a GraphQL. It'll just monster. But anyway, the thing is, is that this gives me the ability to be a much more efficient developer when I'm looking at my old SQL code and I'm going, oh my god, I need to get this onto the cloud. I wrote this when I was 17. I didn't know SQL very well. I learned it out of a book. And to be able to just type, here's my schema. Can I have that in GraphQL, please? And it goes, there you go. That makes me a more efficient developer. Thank you very much for letting me do that little demo, folks. Uh, I'm Stephen Howell. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm technically on Twitter, but I never use it. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. And thank you so much, NIDC Conf, for letting me speak. Awesome talk. Uh, I assume you'll be available for questions later on. Absolutely. Yeah? I think we have time for one question. First hand up. Go. Yes, sir. Um, so I noticed you were using a temperature of one. Um, yes. Is that not normally advised against for code generation for the just the unpredictability you would want low entropy for that? Yes, it's hard to hear you, but I think you said, uh, why did I leave the temperature at one? The honest answer is, is that I was trying to look down at that monitor because I'm looking at a different screen on my laptop and I didn't want to mess with any of the bits that I couldn't actually click them to move them, but absolutely, yes. So those temperatures, if you're wondering, uh, affect the randomness or the entropy of the type of responses you get. With code generation, you want to get a number of different generations depending on the type of uh, code it is. So it's very little complex code has only one answer. I mean, there's a programming language where its, uh, it's slogan is there's more than one way. And uh, not, not that many people use that programming language anymore because, you know, they've, they've all switched to Python for some reason. But when, when you look at uh, languages which are very um, proscriptive, this is the way you do it, you often think, well, wait a minute, I often have situations where that won't work. So Code Whisperer will give you five or six different options if it can, and it does that by affecting the temperature. Absolutely. Yeah, but the real answer is I couldn't see it to click it and try it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank great you. talk. Also, the first talk with an acceptable number of Star Wars metaphors. <laughs> Any other presenters were expecting that much or more. Okay. The, the yeah, I, I cut them way down. Yeah. I cut them way down. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So uh, we will resume at 11.30 uh, with a talk on the topic of imposter syndrome. So please return if you think you're good enough. Okay. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>